Shalom, shalom, Israel. Thank you for tuning in to another Wednesday uh, history class. I'm your main teacher tonight, Yashamai, and to my left. Stephen. All praise be to the Most High. We appreciate y'all for tuning in. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share all the content. Uh, like the, uh, the uh, Facebook page, True Nation Israelite Congregation. Share the content. Let's get this word out so we can go home. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in. Um, as you can see by tonight's uh, title, we're going to be jumping into the Renaissance era. Era, excuse me. Um, this is definitely a peculiar time period because of how much our people was going through and everything that we contributed. And by the end of the lesson, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You know, there's been a constant uh, push in this world to make sure that Israelite lives do not matter. But all praise be to the Most High and the spirit that he gave us, it's undeniable. You know, our presence is here. It's always going to be felt, and we've contributed so much to this world. Uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to completely cover everything we've done. So jumping in to the topic, like I said, we're touching on the Renaissance era. Um, it's also called the Reformation era, and you'll see exactly why in a little bit as we continue on through the lesson. Um, and this is a part of the Dark Ages, right? The Dark Ages is a historical periodization traditionally referring to the Middle Ages. This is between the 5th, some people say the 4th, all the way to the approximately the 17th century. That asserts that a demographic, cultural, and economic deterioration occurred in Western Europe following the decline of the Roman Empire. So the Renaissance era within the Dark Ages happens to be from the 14th century to about the 17th century, right? So with this... There's a, a specific scripture we want to keep in mind because this is the epitome of Esau, right? Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 24. And you will see how our enemies use this against us and how it worked in their favor, right? So the book of Job, chapter 9, and verse 24. Job, chapter 9, verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. You see that? The Most High said the earth has been given into the hand of the wicked. When Israel fell out of power, when we weren't keeping the commandments and the Most High removed that status from us, he said the wicked took over. The Most High created us to be over this earth ruling, as stated in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. He said, I made you all above everybody else on this earth. You were supposed to be ruling it. But when we're not in power, it says the wicked takes control. Go ahead. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. You see that? It says the wicked, they cover the faces of the judges thereof. The judges that the Most High put on this earth were the 12 tribes of Israel and all of our righteous forefathers. Most High said our faces would be covered, and you will see what that's talking about. Go ahead. If not, where and who is he? And then that's the thing. The Most High is saying, well, damn, whoever's ruling at that time period, and we know exactly who's ruling right now, the so-called white man whose real nationality is Esau, Edom in the Bible. If he's not the wicked, then you tell me who is. You show me who is. By the end of this lesson, you'll definitely understand why the Bible says this and why it's true. We don't have to make any assumptions or guess. We're going off facts, things that have been historically documented, proven to be true, all right? So, like I said, Job 9 and 24, this is the biggest scripture that we're dealing with because we're going to see how Esau used these tactics to pretty much deceive the world, deceive the people to get political gain and to get all these higher statuses on the earth up until the position that he's in right now, which is chief ruler. All right. So one thing to understand, given the time period, um, we showed you what era that we're dealing with in the centuries that were involved. It said that there was a social and cultural um, deteriorate. Uh, deteri uh, Where's that? Uh, cultural and economic deterioration, excuse me, uh, that was going on in Western Europe. So dealing with around the, the 14th century, uh, this is what we've a lot, of been a lot of times been taught within our public school systems. During history class, at some point or another, we all learned about the Black Death, also known as the Black Plague, where all these different animals and uh, carrier bugs and fleas were attaching themselves to these rodents, and these rodents ran rampant throughout Europe, killing millions upon millions of people. They said one of the world's worst pandemic plagues ever, right? You know, it has <laughs> the uh, COVID ain't got nothing on the Black Death, or also known as the Black Plague, right? So 
given the uh, the severity of that plague and how many people were dying, you can understand why, you know, at that time, the, the cultures and even the economy as a whole was collapsing. You have l literally millions of people that were dying from this disease. Um, in so much things like Ring Around the Rosie, as we all know and love as kids growing up, that was something that was attributed to that time. Because of the plague and how it affected people and how they died, that song is actually what that was for. Yeah. Ring Around the Rosie, because when you would get sick, you would have these big pus bubbles and boils that would grow on your face, right? So let's say that's that Ring Around the Rosie. Pocket full of posies. It was a, a situation where people were dead all over the streets. You think walking through downtown L.A., Skid Row is bad? Imagine hundreds of thousands of dead people on the streets. There's nowhere, there's nowhere to bury them. So people would carry incense on them, around them, because you couldn't, you couldn't enjoy a walk out in the town because of how much stench it was. Pocket full of flowers. Yeah. So pocket full of posies. Uh, what comes next? Uh, ring around the rosy. Pocket full of posies posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. It got to the point to where they just had to start putting these people in the incendiary. Throwing them, just light them up on the streets, burn them up. Get the smell away, get the smell out. Right? So, all of this is going on, the, the economy is horrible, all these different cultures of people, because Europe is a, a very large landmass. You had all these different cultures of people that pretty much were being affected all at once, and there was nothing that they can do about it. Everyone is scrambling. They're trying to figure out what's going on, right? So after all of that has passed, because that wasn't something that was like a two-year process. It was years upon years that people were affected by that plague. So after it's all said and done, everything's starting to get revitalized. People are getting healthy again. The disease goes away. Uh, this is the part that we get into. And this is an excerpt uh, from an article that was written by Dr. Robert Peterson. Um, and it states, when the great plagues of the 14th century rolled through e uh, Europe, I'm about to say Egypt. <laughs> when, the, when the great plagues of the 14th century rolled through Europe, humanity was fragile and answers were sought to how such a destructive force could so quickly ravage the population. Because like I said, millions upon millions of people died instantly, right? It said Jews already uh, uh, dissenters in the eyes of the Christian populations were an easy scapegoat. So when you understand Israel, right, just like today, we're hated by the masses, but also loved. It was no different from our people back then. Israel always upheld themselves for the most part in a high, a high standard, the way we carried ourselves. Even like when you get into the book like Babylon and Timbuktu and you see how our people were carrying themselves and how we were living once we got exiled out of our homeland due to Roman persecution. We was living in these different countries within Africa. It said, man, we had some of the best jobs. We were the best architects, uh, masons, leather workers, mathematicians, scientists, all of that. Our people always carried that about ourselves throughout our history and the other nations generally were jealous of us because of that. So no different. We're doing the same thing in Europe, doing the same thing in all these other places that were scattered because you have to remember at this point our people are scattered. This is the 14th century, so we're dealing with the 1300s, right? Our people are already scattered. You got some people still back home. You got some people in Arabia. You got some people in, uh, in uh, uh, Syria still. The 10 tribes, the majority of them left, came to America. So all this scattering has already happened, right? So it says when all of that was going on, people were looking for solutions as to why this is going on. And remember, the doctrine that we teach has always caused problems in this world. Just like in the book of Acts, I believe, where uh, the apostles were going to a new city and the people was warning them, like, dude, these men who turned the world upside down have come here also? What we teach and the faith that we have in the Most High has always been a problem for the other nations. So they're looking for answers. Why is this possible? whoop de whoop whoop Fingers start pointing at us. It must be them. Just like, uh, I don't know if y'all is familiar, but the whole COVID, y'all remember where it started, right? Over there in China. After a while, they started to say it was the black people in China who caused it. No different, right? So it says, Jews already dissenters in the eyes of the Christian populations were an easy scapegoat. Religious differences between Jews and Christians established the foundation of misunderstanding and eventual hatred that would later fuel the accusations that the Jews were the cause of the great plagues in the 14th century, uh, perpetuating the uh, perennial persecution of the Jews in the centuries to come. So technically, they weren't wrong. 
When the Most High said this world would be in perfect balance, y'all be ruling with no problems if we kept the commandments, they weren't technically wrong about blaming us for it. And that's the thing about our enemies. They know who we are. Just like Psalm 83 goes into, it says, look, they, they, they all got the same, they on the same page, they all on the same accord. We need to make sure that the name of Israel is no longer spoken in these Israelites' mouths. We need to do everything we can to make sure they're not keeping these commandments. And just like in the book of Judith, it said, hey, if you want to go and fight them Israelites, you better make sure you're going to go fight them when there's wickedness within the camp. Because then you'll surely get the win. But if they, if they keeping the commandments, they God is going to be for them and you're going to die. Our enemies know who we are, Right? So they get to blaming us, and like I said, this is actually what fueled the hatred for our people for the centuries to come, because you'll understand there was a lot more expulsion, a lot more death that started to come upon our people because of what we practice. And one thing you got to understand, too, is our people were the original Christians. Go to the book of Acts. And I want... Give me Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. A lot of these, you know, religious sects and things of today, a lot of them were created by Israel. I'm not saying they were 100% correct, but back then it was a lot more pure than what it is today. And this rebirth, right, this uh, Renaissance era had a lot to do with how these religions ended up today. So go ahead and get that. Acts 11 verse 26. Uh-huh. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. The disciples were called Christians mm -hmm. first in Antioch. You see that? So the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Been already on this. So later on, when brothers and sisters start to go on their ministries and discipleship, they're traveling, they start to set up these churches, and it's like, hey, we already been called the Christians. This is a Christian church, right? So these are how these things are being set up, but we're going to see how later on in time all of that got changed due to our enemies infiltrating and taking over. So um, like I said, every, everything was in a, a pretty horrible state around this time. Once everything is rebuilding, right, we're getting into the, the, the late 14th, early 15th centuries. Everything is rebuilding all of these different cultures that were already living in those areas, they're starting to band together. And what happens with that is that now you have a whole lot of cultures who are not only meeting but merging, right? Just like here in America. What Europe had going on back then was similar to what America has right now, where it's like you got a place where you come here, you walk outside, you look to your left, you see the Hindu shop, you look straight, you got the African shops, you look right, you got the, the Presbyterian and the Catholic, like everything, all cultures reside here. That's a lot what Europe ended up being because of the mass destruction that happened. People had to start banding together. Uh, n cultures who usually would have nothing to do with the other part were now friends. They're learning how to build communities with one another, right? So with that, you're dealing with the rebirth because, remember, everything was destroyed. All these different cultural arts, um, foods, everything dealing with the lifestyle back then was completely new because of all the merging and, and, and uh, fusing that was going on. So um, with that, that's where Esau starts to make his comeback. Because you got to remember, Esau, his last reign was through Rome. Rome been died. Rome fell, I believe, in the 4th or 5th century. We're dealing with 10 centuries later, almost 1,000 years, about 1,000 years, and some change later, Esau starts to make his return, right? So um, with Esau making his return, keeping in mind that Job 9.24 his whole thing was, I'm coming, I'm coming back for real, for real. I'm coming back <laughs> with a chip on my shoulder. I'm taking over everything. What perfect time. When everything is rebuilding, destruction just happened, he's coming through with the cape on like, I'm here to save y'all. And he's just coming out the caves himself, <laughs> right? So he used that as prime opportunity to take over and really start to reinvent himself and reestablish himself. So, uh, and that's also something they used because Israel was the top dog at that time. So to take us out was his main goal because once we're divided, scattered, that left everything open for him to take. So with that, we come into a situation where there was something called the Al uh, Alhambra Decree. And this was something that was agreed upon and happening throughout Europe all throughout this time, even before we start getting to the main expulsions of the Jews where it was really noted within about the, the 15th and 16th century. It was happening many times uh, 
hundreds of years before that on much smaller levels. But this decree was put out, and the decree was to get the Jews from among us. Kick them out. That was the decree. At any cost, we don't care if you have to kill them, you fighting, get them out of here. So there's at least 15 different accounts on record where our people were forced out of uh, all these different countries in, in Europe, you know, by smaller numbers to bigger numbers to bigger groups. All that was happening within this time, right? Setting up the stage. It's completely, it's completely open game right now, right? So it says the Alhambra decree. It says European countries expelled the Jews from their territories on at least 15 occasions. Before the Spanish expulsion, because the Spanish uh, Inquisition, as it's also called, was another big point in time where our people would be getting kicked out of our lands. Israel's been living like a pilgrim for a long time now, <laughs> getting kicked out of land, out of land. And it all started with Adam getting kicked out of the garden. So kind of just goes to show the life our people have been living. Same thing here. We think this is our homeland. Most high finna kick us up out of here, but our next destination is home. Right. So it says European countries expelled the Jews from their territories on at least 15 occasions before the Spanish expulsion. The Jews had been expelled from England in 1290, several times from France between 1182 and 1354. So we're dealing with about 200 year spans multiple times. They love us when they love us and they hate us when they hate us. All right, Israel, it's time for y'all to go. And the thing is. Let them tell it according to history. These were the white Jews. No, these was Israelites, Israelites, Solomon, black skinned people, dark skinned, melanated. The same people you see in today even goes for our 10 tribe brothers because they dark, too. Right. It says. <clears throat> and several times from France between 1182 and 1354 and from some German states. This is what we're dealing with, the rebirth pretty much of wickedness, the reformation. Everything is re being re uh, rebirthed, but by the wicked. Again, that Job 9.24, when he says he covereth the faces of the judges, you can see how they started to do that. But it gets more detailed. Don't worry about it. Uh, give me uh, 1 Maccabees chapter 1 and verse uh, 41. Watch this. Verse Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 41. Uh -huh. Moreover, King Antioch wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. Yep. And everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandments you of the You see that? King. So this is something in history that happens to repeat itself. When the nations get in a position over us, they like to change things for good. Because, again... When Israel is in rulership, that means all the other nations, uh, all the other nations are in subjection to us. So anytime they get a chance to rule, they're gonna try to write it out as long as possible. The main key for success for the heathens to rule a long time is if Israel is not keeping the commandments. So he said, "Look, it was a decree that was put out way back in Greece, right? All y'all, y'all gonna be living up under this territory within these boundaries. Y'all not gonna be keeping y'all traditions. Y'all keeping the traditions of this land." Y'all going to be leaving off from y'all laws. And it said the heathen agreed. Read on. Yeah, many, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion. And you had wicked Israelites that would consent to the religion as well. Our people oftentimes had a lot more dignity than the people. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a larger number of Israelites who had a lot more dignity than the few that you see in the scriptures who were wicked. That's, a, that's the reason why we kept getting kicked out of these lands, because you got to understand the, the Christian movement that you read about in this time period wasn't the Christian, the, the Christian church that was set up back in the time of Acts. This was wickedness now. They're teaching people, hey, this all you got to do to get to, uh, to get the kingdom. This all you got to do. Believe in Jesus. You ain't got to keep the commandments. Same nonsense. But they were being real forceful with how they were pushing that, that doctrine. The Christian church. Islam, they all went on slaughtering campaigns, either believe or die. So when our people wasn't getting down with the program, they said, y'all going to mess up what we got going all right. Uh, the, uh, the other heathens, the other nations, they already agreed that they wasn't going to do what they're going to do. They're going to follow the laws of the land. Y'all making this uh, hard for us. So they got policies being printed up, laws being printed up. Israelites got to get up out of here. That's what you got to understand, especially dealing with the Spanish Inquisition. That was a couple of hundred years later. 
But our people were literally being burnt at the stake for keeping Sabbath days. Our forefathers and foremothers was losing their lives to uphold the doctrine that the Most High gave us. Literally, we had high positions and we got kicked up out of there because uh, the Catholic Church came through and said, nah, this is what we believe now. They was taking our Bibles, burning them. And that's where you get the, the term Morano from. Later on, it translates into more. But the secret Jews, because we had to keep our feast days and our, our holy feasts and festivals low key. Because it was literally a death penalty if you was caught. Or super high taxes, uh, jail time, all of that. Same thing that we're working our way up to now because it's no different. Esau says, hey, this is how we doing things here in America. Y'all trying to keep the commandments. Y'all going to uproot us. We can't have that. So if you caught teaching on a Saturday street corner, you're getting tased. You're getting shot down. You're going to jail. All those times is coming for sure. You better bet on it. So same thing, right? All these different laws being put out because our people upholding the way of the most high. And that's why I put out the scripture in First Maccabees because that's exactly what's going on till this day. He said, hey, leave off from your tradition, do as the way of the land, and that's what our people do. We don't call ourselves Israelites. We don't call ourselves Jews or Hebrews. We're African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic, I'm Mexican, all of that. And you keeping Christmas, Easter, Halloween. What does that have to do with you and your people? Just goes to show what was said in Maccabees. If it ain't broke, you ain't got to fix it. They said, hey. Feed them the same script. They fall for it every time. You ain't got to reinvent the wheel, right? So with all of this happening, right, you just got to keep, keep everything, um, you know, in line and, and understand, understand how it's painted out. Israel used to be on top. They had a lot of power in Europe. They're getting us up out of there. Uh, calamity, death, the economy is horrible. Everything is in a state of destruction, needs to be rebuilt. We getting kicked up out of the land, what does that leave for our enemies? Everything. It wasn't like they said, here, take your home, take all your goods. No, they was just kicking us out. Take your best coat because it's cold out there and leave. All the artifacts that we had in those lands, everything that we had to contribute to those lands stood there with our enemies when we left. So that's when we jump into iconoclasm, right? And... Before we go to iconoclasm, read Job chapter 9, verse 24 again, because watch this. Job 9, 24. Uh -huh. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covered the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Well, so I said, where and who is he? So you got all this going on, right? And this is the time where Esau took it upon himself to infiltrate and take over all of these different religions that our people had set up. And again, they weren't exactly 100%, but they were a lot more on point than what it is today. We getting kicked up out of there and they taking everything for themselves. So that means uh, all the paintings that you see from the Russian icons, when you Google Russian, uh, Russian icons, you see all those black images of uh, Moses when he's doing this and all of that type of stuff. Like I said, we wasn't 100% correct. We wasn't worshiping no white Jesus and no white saints, but our people was setting up idols just of ourselves. <laughs> as much as we use that to say, look, the Jews were black. Yeah, we know that, but those were the idols of back then. Our people was a little bit more on point, still off, but it's okay. So the Catholic church, Christian church, all these different uh, saints and everything you see, there was the black images. That's what our people had up at that time. And they were still kept in good condition for the most part by historians, but for the majority of uh, that land and how the images were going to be portrayed throughout the rest of the world, that's where we jump into iconoclasm. So iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is the social belief and the importance. Listen, iconoclasm is the social belief in the importance of the destruction of icons and other images or monuments most frequently for religious or political reasons. You had groups of Edomites who felt it was of the utmost importance to destroy all the monuments, all the paintings, and other images that our people had up, whether it be for, for religious purposes or political purposes. Again, Esau used deceit to work his way up to the top. 
this is where you can go on Google and find the once black images of Moses, the apostles, all the religious figures that you see in the scriptures, once black, painted white. It wasn't good enough for them just to destroy everything and said, we're starting from scratch. What does Esau do best? He lets you build up an amazing building, will kill you, and then write your name on the paper saying you built it. Or he built it, should I say. Esau is lazy. He just takes whatever else someone set up and says he did it. All the inventions that we're known for throughout slavery creating. <laughs> right. He did it. And then go as far as to actually make it his color, right? Because I heard black people created the toilet and they made that white. Yep, street signs, cell phones, but you would think white people did this. It's no different. All these offices that was left vacant, this is where you read about the papacy, dealing with Catholicism. Esau took that over because Israel was gone. The nations, they coming together, they searching for answers. Who's going to lead us? We got all this amazing culture right here, all these new arts and, and musical things going on. Esau said, I'm here. Don't worry about it. Move to the side. So he comes in with iconoclasm, right? Destroying the images. And not only destroying the images, placing those images out to the world as if it's fact. And this is actually where you start to get into why we worship a a white image of Christ in 2020 for the majority of our people. How did that become the prevalent thing in the world? I don't care where you are in the world. They're going to know that white image of Christ. A lot of that has to do with this time period right here. The rebirth, right? Rebirth of wickedness. So go to 1 Maccabees chapter 3 and verse 48. So Esau had a plan. When he come in, he wasn't just drawn over these pictures just because. He had a plan. He said, nah. If we're going to do this, we're going to do it the right way. We are the saints. We are the apostles, right? We are the holy children of Israel. Go ahead. First Maccabees 3 and 48. Uh -huh. And laid open the book of the law, wherein ye heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their image. You see that? The heathen, they found it best to paint the likeness of their images. That's literally down to what we can see on paper and on wall. And also because... An image has everything to do with your thought process, an idea. They painted out their ideas for our people, and now we follow through with those ideas to this day. That's why slavery was so genius for, uh, for Esau. Because now, it's not a situation where we need chains. Look at our people. They probably laugh about it. Look at them. It doesn't matter how many times you shoot them, they will not fight back. Why do you need chains when we act like this? They don't need chains no more. We already trained mentally. Because at the end of the day, when you praying at night and you, God, I just want things to be better, you think about a white man. And that's why people say, well, not all white people are bad. Because that's the only white, so-called white person that, that they think is not bad is Jesus Christ. I, I guarantee it. Well, not all white people are bad. Name one. <laughs> well, you, you, just, you just being over dramatic. No, you, I'm waiting on you to name one. It's, it's plenty of them. Who? You know some. Who? They never answered. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, Frankie uh, Muniz. <laughs> yeah, right. And then you got our people. They, they over there making these coon-ass jokes. You got Lil Wayne talking about he know a whole bunch of messed up black people, but I know a, I know a good white boy named, uh, I think his name was Uncle Bobby, who saved him from, uh, oh, yeah, shot himself. yeah, I know a good white man named Mr. Bobby, or whatever his name was. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you can just see, though, how the long-term effects, you know, really played out with this. It's the reason why they call this the rebirth. You know, everything is spiritual, uh, understanding what's going on. This was the rebirth of wickedness. This is Esau's time. Since then, he's been the top dog, working his way up continuously, continuously. You heard about the Ottoman Turks? Well, this is a group of people around this time not too far after. Esau said, man, it's not good enough that we sit in here infiltrating the papacy, everything the children of Israel left behind since they go into slavery and captivity. We're taking over other nations, too. They go into war. They slaughter them to there's pretty much no more left. And they say, you know what, now? We're the Greeks. 
Because the original Greeks weren't white. <laughs> but history, you think the Greeks has always been white. The Ottoman Turks, right? This is what we're dealing with. The evil of evils. Esau, fueled by Satan himself. So, all of this is going on, right? Iconoclasm is playing a huge part in uh, society because earlier how when I read the definition of iconoclasm, it said it was used for political and also religious gain. You'll see how they use this to fight other religions because Esau, people forget, Esau isn't just here just to combat Jacob. He's combating the whole world. That's why everybody hates him. When you go into the scriptures, it talks about, man, Esau, how has he fallen? <laughs> the man who was making kingdoms shake because of the bombs he was dropping, the, the, the heathen can't wait for Esau to fall. Honestly, Esau was destroying other nations, pillaging their lands, raping their people, taking their culture, saying it was theirs, just like today. Literally, I guarantee you, you, you don't think it's odd how a lot of these entertainers be dying their hair blonde? A lot of them do it. Chris Brown be dying his hair blonde. Lil Dirt got his hair blonde. Chris Brown. Yeah. All these jakes be doing, uh, dying their hair blonde. A hundred years from now, I guarantee you Chris Brown will be white. I guarantee it. LeBron James, Kobe. <laughs> I guarantee it. Uh, in another lesson, but uh, essentially, uh, Satan uh, is the actual spirit, right, that fuels Esau. So Lucifer is a title more so. <clears throat> Satan is the actual entity itself. So uh, you got that instance with Job when... He went to go present himself before the Most High, and it said Satan came and talked to the Most High about, hey, let me go and tempt Job. Satan itself is the spirit, that evil spirit that the Most High created. Lucifer is a title. The devil, it's not so much a title. It's an actual thing, but it's, you know, uh, of Satan pretty much. You're dealing with the devil, someone who is deceitful, a deceiver, a false accuser. Right, so you can be a devil, but you can't be Satan. Satan is a spirit, right? I don't. So, um, so like I said, right, all this is going on, and then you jump uh, a couple of hundred years later, still within the same time period, right? And like I was touching on, dealing with the image that we know of today as Jesus Christ, which really, if you just take a time to do your research, you will understand that that is not Christ. That is actually a man by the name of Caesar Borgia, or Cesare Borgia, as some people say. Call him Chesie B. <laughs> Caesar Bo, right? Caesar, Caesar Borgia was the son of Rodrigo Borgia, who later was known as Pope Alexander VI, right? Really uh, powerful family, a really wicked family. Caesar Borgia was known as someone who committed incest. He slept with, you know, his sisters and things like that. He was also a homosexual, also a, a wicked man who was uh, the cause for a lot of people being murdered. Killed his own brother. Yeah, a, a really wicked individual, right? And like I said, he was a homosexual. And like I said, when you look at the Renaissance period, this is a really rich cultural time for things like art. And it's not only what's being painted or what's being sung, but just all different types of art. One of the most uh, famous artists on the world, or in the world, excuse me, Leonardo da Vinci. This man, he was an Italian Renaissance polymath, which pretty much it just means he was a, a very smart man. He was learned in a lot of different uh, you know, areas. And uh, he actually painted Caesar Borgia as Christ, as the Godhead or a God, right? It says, Leonardo da Vinci's portraits of his supposed lover, Caesar Borgia, a vile mass murderer, was painted in the images that everyone came to accept as Jesus Christ. This remodeling, right, the rebirth of everything was to suit the Europeans who were at war with Islam. They were using this as a political thing and also a religious thing on attack on Islam because, remember, they're fighting for world power at this point. They said, hey, Islam, y'all sitting there saying, y'all gods melanated and whoopty woo woo watch what we going to do. This our God right here. <laughs> that's when you get into Hitler and talking about the white race is the most purest and authentic race, and that's, that's where all that comes from, right? 
That's the aftermath of what they've done with that image. And that also lets you know where the real power lies. Because it was more than just Israelites living in Europe at that time. Why did Esau cleave to the Israelites' culture? Why wasn't the Hindu image of one of their gods pushed throughout the world as truth? Because they knew, hey, the power's within the scriptures. Jesus Christ, King of Kings, <laughs> he's the one who, who's about to rule this world. Who better to use than him? Right? So I find it funny that, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, it's accused that he was a lover with Caesar Borgia. And you know what his two most famous paintings are, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, Caesar Borgia yeah, Caesar as Jesus. Borgia. That's, his, that's, that's one of his most famous. And what's the other one? Nah, I have no idea. Mona Lisa. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mona Lisa. Who is rumored to be a man. <laughs> um, most High said, man, the, the wicked have taken this earth and, and put they, they've ruled this earth. They've covered the faces of the judges. Do you see how they've covered our people's faces with lies, deceit? He said, hey, literally covering our faces. The real judges of this earth aren't even black or Latino. They're us, white people. Most High said, if that's not the wicked, who and where is he? Come on now. So... We got Esau running rampant all throughout Europe, taking over, starting wars. And if, when you really read into the Dark Ages, you'll see, man, Esau was doing a lot of underhanding, right? He was going into kingdoms, and uh, I believe it's called espionage. Is that what it's called? When, uh, oh, no, no, uh, espionage and treason, for one. He was, he was doing both of that. But he would go into these other kingdoms, get right up under the higher-ups, and make them go at odds. So when they fighting... He's slipping right in and taking their spot and kicking them both out. Esau, man, this dude was diabolical in how he was moving in these times. Diabolical. So we get into a time period where, you know, he was on a campaign. It wasn't like this all happened in one night. It was years and years and years. It was building up and things were happening to where all this power was being accumulated, right? But also in this same time, look at the, uh, the uh, magnificence of the Most High. We got King James, was king of Scotland from 1567 and also king of Ireland uh, from 1603 until 1625, which is when he died. In the midst of everything Esau has going up, there's such a large push to make sure our people is, is losing sight of who they are. There are cultures being left behind and taken up by another people saying it's theirs. You got the Most High placing that spirit on King James to say, hey, make sure this word is about to go out. Our people's being sent out, right, expelled from all these different lands. And that's why the Bible says this. Get Isaiah 28 and 11. The Most High is genius on how he works. With everything going on, literally in the midst of our people being sent out to all these different destinations, you already know they're about to be amongst people that don't speak the same language as them. So what did the Most High do? Go ahead. Isaiah 28 and 11. Uh-huh. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. It's the same reason why we got this Bible in all these different languages today. Most High is genius. He said with a stammering lips and a different tongue, he's going to speak to our people. Go ahead. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. This is our rest. Most High said it didn't matter what was going on because this ain't our first time being expelled. He said, y'all should be used to it by now. Wherever you at going through hell, this is going to be your rest. Because when you get back to this how you're supposed to be, I'm going to put you back home. Our people have had small instances of home. But right now what we're fighting for is to go truly home. Because we had long periods of time, thousand years, our people were ruling. Sounds good, right? But I, in the back of my head, I'll be like, man, it's, it sucks because one day it's going to end. We, yeah, a thousand years. Our people was ruling. We had rulership on this earth. That's what we're dealing with with the Dark Ages. No, in the, the Dark Ages in history. Well, that, that's getting into to one aspect of it, but th that's really what it's getting into right here. I didn't, I didn't touch on that 
because it wasn't really the class for that. But like, you talking about like how the devil shall be cast away for a thousand years, and well, put it this way: when when did Rome end? The fifth century, the fourth century. Esau came back into power the fifteenth century, the fourteenth century. It's a thousand years. So he was gone. He was in the caves doing him. We had rulership on this earth, and that's not the first time. Like I said, you go back to 70 AD when our people was kicked out of Israel, and we ran into all the different countries in Africa. We was in, ruling in Africa for hundreds upon hundreds of years, doing fine. So we've had all these small instances of home, but it's never truly been our home. So, I don't think I see nobody. There's someone out there, bro. There's someone by the door? No, I was like about to finish, but they're, they're leaving. Oh, kind, kind. <clears throat> yeah, you're going down to the liquor store. So you had all this stuff going on, right? Um, everything is happening with our people being kicked out, losing our identity, losing our culture. And the Most High put it upon our brother King James because that was a black man. That was an Israelite man. It's documented throughout history. And the great work that he had put in to make sure that this word was being translated carefully to make sure our people could one day get back home. Love the Most High. He's genius. And on top of that, you read into the history of King James and how they did everything they can to slander him and destroy his name. That's why the first thing you hear out of people's mouths today was, well, King James was a homosexual. Well, so are a lot of the entertainers you like. You don't say nothing about them. Let's call a spade a spade. You wasn't tripping when Caesar Borgia was your god. He was a homosexual. You ain't had nothing to say about that. But when you, exactly. Here you go with that religious stuff again. Yeah, all right. That's what I thought. As soon as it pertains to righteousness, oh, he was a homosexual. He was this. He, so what? If he was, you still living in error. Keep these commandments. I, I can't follow no Bible. Like, all right, then, whatever. <laughs> You voting this year, right? A lot of these politicians is gay. Come on now. Our people like to play games. But it's all good, though. The Most High said, man, this word is going to go out, and his word don't come back uh, void. He's going to gather and accomplish everything it's meant to gather and accomplish. So Isaiah 28 and 11, like I said, Most High said he was going to talk to our people with stammering lips in a different tongue, making sure we always had a way to get back to him. Um, and, you know, there was such a push to destroy our law and that's why it was really uh, a beautiful thing that the Most High allowed, you know, King James through his authority and rulership to make sure that we have this, this Bible today in the way that we have it. Because if it was left up to Esau, our Bible would be one page with a couple of verses that said, obey your master, uh, <laughs> do good unto those that despitefully use you. <laughs> if you get hit, turn the other cheek. That's all our Bible would be if it was left up to Esau. So all praise be to the Most High. So, you know. Uh, and go to Obadiah chapter 1. Well, it's only chap one chapter. But go to Obadiah and read verse 1 through 6. Watch this. Verse 6? Mm -hmm. No, one, and 1 through 6. Okay. Obadiah 1 and 1. <laughs> the vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God, concerning Edom. Edom got, Esau got his own book in the Bible. This is specifically for you. Go ahead. A rumor from the Lord and an, Obama, an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Mm -hmm. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. Yep. Behold, I have, I have made thee small among the heathen. See, the Most High made Esau very small, literally as a nation. Uh, if you want to go down into a scientific level, you look at his anatomy how he's structurally built. He's a weak nation, a very small. Small is another word for weak, right? They can't be in the sun. He's the only nation that can't be in the sun because they get skin cancer and get all eaten up. <laughs> they, they can't dance. They don't know how to cook well. They stink when they sweat. The list goes on and on. He's a weak nation. Go ahead. Small among the heathen. Uh -huh. Thou art greatly despised. It said, but you greatly despised. Everybody hates you. Go ahead. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Uh huh. Thou art dwelt in the cliffs of the rocks. You see that? It says the pride of your heart has deceived you because Esau is the only man on this earth who took what was the children of Israel's and said it is his. No other nation has done that. 
The other nations borrow it and use it, but you ain't never seen no Asian picture of Christ. <laughs> you ain't never seen that. But Esau, he said, no, nah, I'm taking this a step further. He said, most high, I said, your pride has deceived you. Go ahead. It said, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, the Hollywood Hills, all these mansions that are stuck up in the mountains. That's Esau. He loves doing that. Go ahead. Whose habitation is high, uh -huh. that say it in his heart. Who shall bring me down to the ground? Yep. Thou, thou that, wait. Though, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. Isn't historically the eagle one of Esau's favorite emblems and favorite things to use on his flags and his coins? Rome used it. America uses it. If I'm not mistaken, I think Greece used it. Go ahead. And thou, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, uh -huh. then will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Uh -huh. If the, if thieves, what is this? Is, came, uh, if, if thieves came to, to yeah, thee. if thieves came to thee, if if robbers by night. Watch this. The Most High is like, dude. Like anybody else. Like if if robbers came to you and thieves came, go ahead. How art thou cut off? Uh huh. Go ahead. Would that would they not have stolen? Till they had enough. It said, would they not have stolen until they've had enough? Esau said, hell no. I'm stealing on top of stealing. At a certain point, you'd be looking at all these videos on Black Friday when people be run up in the stores. They got a flat screen in this hand and a PlayStation and Xbox in this hand. They like, all right, I'm cool. I ain't taking no more. Esau said, man, I'm making trips to the car. I'm dropping this off. I'm taking everything. Go ahead. If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not have... Would they not leave some great? It's saying, dude, anybody else would have left something. Esau, you didn't leave anything. A complete bastard. Go ahead. How are, how are the things of Esau sacred out, scattered, searched, searched, searched out? How are his hid things sought up? Man, Most High said, how 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 is your way of life being exposed, right? How are the things of Esau searched out? How does he reason with these things? Why does he do the things he do? And it says, how are his hidden things sought up? Esau's a bastard. Most High said, if Job 9.24, if he's not the wicked, you show me who and where is he? That's the prime scripture of tonight, right? So dealing also with that time period, you know, like I said, you have a, a lot of art that was being you know, introduced into the world uh, in a new fashion. It's not like music was new, but the type of music is like hip hop. It took over the world. There was no such thing as hip hop before like that. Hip hop hit the scene and took over the complete world, right? Same thing with back then. And just like in today's time, you got your Macklemore's, your Eminem's. You would think rap is something that belongs to white people. No difference from back then, right? You got your Beethoven's. William Shakespeare, theater, and music at an all-time high? These was black people. You Google them today, I bet you some white faces pop up. They steal everything. <laughs> everything. And then they have to work twice as hard to learn the product that they stole just to keep up with the lie. You got five- and six-year-old Israelite babies, they be... Got beats and all that naturally. And then you got Esau, they taking notes. Okay, so there's about a two-second delay between every, okay? <laughs> and they're snapping at every 0.5. They got to do all that to learn what we're doing naturally. That's real. Jakes who couldn't read, could barely speak, sitting here learning all these different tools and things being used in studios to make beautiful instrumentations and just legendary songs. Then you got Esau, he going to school for it. <laughs> Just to keep up with the lie. You look at some of the greatest producers, they put up the white ones real quick. Scott Storch, even though he, he is a, a dope producer, there's a lot better Israelite producers and a lot more. But they stick to the, the minority, right? So, like I said, same thing. They, they, they steal everything and um, they discredit you and also discard you when you're no longer of use. And that's what the scriptures get into. Let's go to the book of Sirach. And this is going to be the last scripture. We're going to close it out. The book of Sirach, chapter 13 and verse 4. This is the epitome of Esau right here. And the Most High gave us clear warning and wisdom on how to deal with these types of people. The Bible is so cold. That's why 
I can't help but laugh in someone's face when they sit here and try to convince me otherwise that I'm, I'm following a cult and what I'm doing is worthless and I should be spending my time better. I, I, can, I can honestly laugh in their face. Just anyone who sit here and try to say this Bible is not true, that this is not the word of the Most High, I can laugh in their face. They complete fools, right? Watch this. Go ahead. So rock 13 and 4. Uh-huh. If thou be for his prophet, he will use thee. <laughs> hey, when Israel's good, Israel's good. Go ahead. But if thou have nothing, he will forsake thee. You see that? When we was in Europe doing our thing, he said, hey, man, we could use this. Yeah, hey. Steven, hey, I mean, I like how you wrap your bandana, man. That's cool. Who taught you that? Oh, man, that's just us. Man, I like that. <laughs> Now it's time for you to get up out of here. You got to leave America, bro. But leave that bandana. <laughs> Put it on. It's me now. <laughs> when you ain't got nothing, he despise you. Go ahead. If thou have anything. If you have anything that is of profit to this man, Esau, go ahead. He will live with thee. He will even live with you. Oh, brother, come on. Yeah. Uh, bro, my best friend's black, man. Uh. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> look at what we contribute. Uh, look at what we contribute to America. America would not be anything without blacks and Latinos, and he knows that, and that's why they live with us. That's it, though. They just live here. They ain't gotta like us, but they will live with us. Go ahead. Yeah, he will make thee bear, and, and he will make you bear, and then what? And will not be sorry for it. He won't even be sorry for it. And that's, and that's the, honestly the part that, that ticks me off about Esau. Because remember, he had a long time period, hundreds of years, where he was living in caves. Our people were teaching them how to walk uprightly because they in these tight spaces to where they crawl in. And, you know, after a while, you sit in a bad position. It's why a lot of our people today always talk about posture, right? Your posture is straight because over time it's going to make you imagine hundreds of years living in cramped spaces. Israel look, I'm not Israel, uh, Esau look like creatures. Yep. They got something called text neck. Our generation, a lot of us, when we're old, we're going to have a neck that's like this because we're always looking down on our phone. <laughs> and that's just about 50 Scoliosis years. Scoliosis and all that. That's just about 50 years. Imagine if you live 400 years of your life in caves, you and your people. After a while, you're going to start looking a lot funny. <laughs> So our people was teaching them how to walk up right again, how to bathe, because they wasn't washing their ass. Teaching them the importance of hygiene. And that's why I said, hey, if you got anything for his prophet, he'll live with you. Cool. He, he didn't mind us being around at that time. But the moment we didn't have anything, it said he despised us, made us bare, and he don't even care about it. We never even got a thank you from Esau. He wouldn't know how to be how he is today if it wasn't for us, because everything we taught him, we never even got a thank you. You know what we got? Go home, nigger. Scriptures is on point, dog. Go ahead. Verse 7. Yep. And he will shame thee by his meats. And then he going to shame you with his meats. I be looking at all these different political parties and all these different political offices, right? And you got Jake's cooning just to sit at the table. You the only black face at that table. You smiling all extra hard, laughing all extra hard at they jokes. You seen that video of that that one black dude? He had them hillbilly teeth. You remember the one we was young? You got the hillbilly teeth you could put in the yeah. fake ones. He had those type of teeth, and he was trying so hard to shake Donald Trump's hand, and Donald Trump whoop, went right past him. He's just like, <laughs> <laughs> he was always that close, right? Oh, pretty close. He's gonna be telling that story for the rest of his life. Will shame you with his meats because you can't even sit at that table comfortably. You know you didn't sold out. You know you're not helping your people. And you shamed by that. But you're trying to make a better way and better life for you and yours. Go ahead. Until he have drawn thee dry twice or thrice. And said he, he's not even going to do that just one time. He said he's going to make sure you ain't got nothing. He will draw you out twice or thrice. This is who we're dealing with, y'all. And like I said, this is just a quick overview of this time period. Wanted to kind of pull out the most important stuff uh, from this era. Like I said, just on some, some regular history knowledge, there is a lot uh, that was going on throughout this era. Like I said, most of it was culturally. 
you can see how a lot of things that was going on back then is still being followed to this day. Um, and something I didn't touch on was the Spanish Inquisition because that was kind of going up into a different region. We was dealing more so with Europe. Um, the Spanish Inquisition was happening in the 15th century all the way up into the 16th century. And that's when our people even got more scattered. That's when we started coming over here to America, uh, you know, getting sent into Portugal and Turkey and all these different places um, because it was, it was a, a hard push to get Israel out. Remember, the rebirth, the reformation, this world couldn't have been reformed in wickedness if all of that did not happen to our people because we weren't just letting it happen. We had something to say about it. That's exactly what happened with Islam, Muhammad, the, the false prophet was super upset with Israel because we weren't just bowing down to his new religion, Islam. We said, hell no. We keep these commandments, homie. What you talking about? So they waged all-out war against our people, took us into slavery. You can read about the sub-Saharan slave trade. It was going down with our people for a long time. But the most I said, you got to fight for him. So with that, Israel, you know, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Please, again... If you like the content, like, share, subscribe to it. Let's get this word out to our people across the four corners of the earth. We almost home, you know. Uh, so be sure to tune in. We got class Friday and also uh, Saturday class closing it out with the bishops. And with that, I'm going to say shalom.